What is up, guys? Welcome to the first episode of the Poker Lab. I have the pleasure of having Crane Place Poker, Damien Johnson, in the booth with me. Welcome, Damien. Thank you so much, Paul. Great to be here. So the way this is going to work, this is a multiple episode YouTube series, and Crane is going to show me the ropes of strategic thinking where I might have leaks in my game. He's going to prepare me for the mistakes, and I'm really excited to be doing that. But before we get into the questions, maybe Crane can introduce himself. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, so yeah, as Paul already said, my name is Damien, aka Crane. People will know me from my uh, cash game streaming on Twitch. Um, yeah, I've been playing poker for, I guess, on and off 10 years now, or maybe slightly more, starting off uh, playing cash games back in the day. Uh, I'm playing with friends as well, the, the normal kind of home game stuff that people usually start playing. And then I found the online world of poker. Um, then I moved more to the MTT sides and started um, really putting a lot of my efforts uh, into that. And then I joined uh, Poker Code, still playing MTTs. And I've been a member there for, for many years now, but also we partner up for my stream as well. And then I moved back to cash games and yeah, started working with people like Stefan Sontheimer, who's our cash game coach there as well, which I get a lot of my thought process, which we'll talk about later uh, from, from that. So Perfect. Thank you. Excited to start the sessions with you. It'd be interesting here to first hear uh, from you, Paul, what your thought process is, like generically. So like your general approach is better to talk generally about stuff rather than the nitty gritty. But like, what's your thought process in game? So like how you approach any spot? Okay, so when I'm in the middle of a hand, I will usually look at the board first before I really look at my my hand specifically. And I always ask myself, like, what do I want to do on this board in general with like a variety of hands? So mm -hmm. let's say I open under the gun and the board comes queen five six rainbow. Like my first question is not what do I want to do with my specific hand, but what do I want to do with my range in this spot? And this info, of course, I took out of practicing GTO wizard a lot. Mm -hmm. So I would usually um, try to simplify my game to a uh, range based action. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if I have aces in that spot or five, six suited. Uh, I kind of want to do the same action on specific board structures. Okay. Awesome. Uh, anything else? Depending on villain, I will start deviating from it. So if I like, if I'm playing 25 and L and I know it's like a super whale, I'm, I'm not going to do like a range check where I would range check against good opponents, but then I will usually just uh, go for straight up value. <laughs> so I, I would differ from the GTO line when I know people are calling me anyways with anything, then I will just mainly play my hand fairly face up. So mm -hmm. bet when I have it, just try to build a pot and uh, check when I don't. Sure, sure. Okay. I mean, there's a mix of things in there, which I think is super great because it already ties into probably what I'm going to say around how I would now approach the game after like learning or um, like what you said, like going through GTO Wizard, speaking to other people, learnings through, yeah, poker code and things like that. Basically, what you're saying um, kind of is like very long winded way of basically the thing that I will uh, say, which is um, basically how I approach the game overall just comes down to three simple questions. And you kind of talked about this anyway. So the first one is, what would be right? So that is the theoretical side of like, like GTO. So like the, what, what would be right is all that stuff you're already studying and learning about different board textures, uh, different ranges, different positions and all that kind of stuff. But what would be right in theory? And um, this is super important because this is what gives you your baseline, right? So. Mm -hmm. When people, I get asked, I don't know if you get asked this in your stream, but someone asked me, I think I was actually watching another person's stream and I jumped in and people are like, oh, hey, you know, Crane's here. Uh, hey, Crane. And it's like, do you play exploit or GTO? Which like doesn't really make sense to me when I hear that kind of question, because it's like GTO is the baseline. There is no way that you can exploit without knowing this baseline. So that's the first thing. It's like, what is what would be right in theory? 
And then you started to talk a little bit about the next part, which is then what is villain doing wrong? And this is then the next important step because that's how we know we want to deviate based on what we know he is doing wrong. And then from that, it's the last question is, uh, what would be the right exploit? Which is also what you kind of talked about as well. So pretty aligned in that way. But if you to sum it up in your mind, or when I'm in a spot, every single spot that I'm in, pre-flop, post-flop, the same three questions every single time, which just make things much easier for you mm -hmm. to be able to navigate. Um, so I like what you said, and I think that's completely, completely right. So you're definitely not, uh, you're definitely on the right, the right path, mm -hmm. but you can even simplify it even more. And I'm quite interested about what you said, where you said, you talked a little, maybe you can tell me a little bit more, but you said, uh, you like to play like your, your range kind of all the same. I mean, if you could talk maybe a little bit more about what you mean by that, that would help. So I usually, uh, try to find like the the best play for my entire range and simplify it to one move so if i mm -hmm. have like a basic example would be i open on the button big blind calls and the board is like two broadways and a low card i will always bet there i i don't have mm -hmm. any other action but big bets on two broadways because I know I have like a range advantage on this board. I have a not hand advantage. My the villain will usually not have any strong hands there in this spot, so it, it doesn't really matter what type of hand I hold myself. I will just do one action always. Perfect. So you kind of like when the board comes out, you're like, who has the advantage on this board? Basically, yeah. that's the first kind of thing you're thinking about, and then you structure your range in a way that. Um, yeah, fits into that kind of board, regardless of your hand, right? Yeah. Okay. This is like this is this is really great. Um, and then like the one thing I would say when because I hear this a lot about um, like these kinds of boards that you want to range bet and things like that. But when you think about your entire range as well, like one thing I think is super helpful or was very helpful to me to kind of learn about is how you like um, that that. There's one thing which is about your range, and then there's another thing about like how your specific hand fits into that range overall. Because it's like certain hands are built for certain things. And the way that now that I'm looking at this is like you need to see your range as like each one of your hands kind of has a job. And mm -hmm. it's up to you to decide what job your hand is given, if you like. So Paul is now the boss of his entire range and mm -hmm. all of his hands. Mm -hmm. And your job as the boss is to give. Uh, select which hands are fit for which job. So, uh, like, let's take a good example that maybe you just mentioned: button versus big blind. Flop comes mm -hmm. is is king for rainbow, and you have queen jack. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, think about maybe I can ask you: like, what kind of jobs would you give something like queen jack? Mm, I think it's a nice bluffing candidate because it's a semi bluff where I, on the one hand, block like good kings, good aces. And then I can apply pressure um, because I still have outs to the nuts. So mm -hmm. even if I bet large and continue barreling, I have the opportunity to win a big pot with another hand on the turn or river, or I can apply max pressure. Yeah, sure. And like this is, a, yeah, again, perfectly right. So we can build, build a big pot now with nut equity, right? Because yeah. um, we have that gut shot, but we... But also the thing is, we don't just have a gut shot. You have a nice six outer to third pair as well. So you can even say like, your hand can be used for multiple jobs. So one job is to build a big pot now with nut equity. Then the other job is maybe you check back and hit that nice uh, third pair on the turn, keeping all that shit that villain has when he defends the big blind and um, turn a really nice hand and build maybe a smaller pot. But the point is, like, you decide, like, which way that you want to go. And mm -hmm. some hands are good for many things. Some hands are very good for w one thing. So, mm -hmm. again, maybe take the same board, button versus big blind, is king for rainbow, and you have pocket deuces. Mm -hmm. What kind of job you give pocket deuces? Mm, none but bluffing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's like, but again, it's like not even so much bluffing. It's like I have, you have, like, fourth pair when you think about it. You have fourth pair, but also once you hit something... Then you hit a set or that backdoor straight draw potentially, which again, if you just work with the two outs for with mm -hmm. pocket deuces to hit that too, it's like 8% flop to river, right? Mm -hmm. Solver likes to build a big pot in this scenario for exactly that reason. Um, so like that's when 
Pocket Deuces falls into that same kind of category where you talked about Broadway, Broadway, small. I want to build a big pot yeah. now um, because I have nut equity or you also mix in your strong hands, right? Like your ace king also betting mm -hmm. the same way. Mm -hmm. And then something like Pocket Deuces, you can build as part of that same range with that knowledge that 8% of the time you will get there on the river or on the turn and hit mm -hmm. a set and then win a monster pot potentially, mm -hmm. right? So like, but... There are other combos then that, like, let's say you have something like, I don't know, maybe yeah, not seven, like the six. best example, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah seven, seven, six. six. Like, yeah. it's like you put this into the same range, probably not, right? You may not. Like, I'm using, for example, on Ace King for Rainbow, pretty much over bet and check as the mm -hmm. simplification. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, again, when you think about that as a strategy, like, when you're mixing in some of these combos like seven six like i don't want to bet seven six like mm -hmm. over bet like this is the hand i want to check back and mm -hmm. um you know pr basically like give up right like this is the kind of thing mm -hmm. so it helps me a lot to really see things as like what jobs i'm giving those hands by being the boss and then you deciding which hands you put into what because um often people make the mistake of just it's like doesn't matter it's like i range bet this board with my four range which can be fine in certain scenarios, obviously, and you can see bet a little bit more, and then you can go down the exploitative route of also maybe people aren't defending enough, they're not calling mm -hmm. c-bets enough, they're not check-raising enough, like all mm -hmm. of these extra things that we will come on to later. Mm -hmm. But um, exactly what, what you've said, but like fitting it into those three questions may just help you just simplify stuff, make it a little bit easier, because you already know it anyway. But mm -hmm. then you can go through that exact thought process in-game, when you know okay i know exactly what will be right if you get to that spot and you don't know what's right where the flop comes maybe like yeah you gave the example earlier under the gun versus big blind flop is king six five i think you said rainbow and it's like okay yeah. now what <laughs> it's like now what now what am i doing and if and, and that's the part where like that even helps you then to think about the most uncomfortable spots that you get in to then formulate like a plan of mm -hmm. how you're going to study for the future, which mm -hmm. is another question that I gave, which is just about off the table stuff, um, mm -hmm. which maybe Paul, you can tell me now about like how you approach that side. So off the tables, mm -hmm. what are you doing? How mm -hmm. do you study? Things like that. The way I study is usually I do three different things. I think one of them is not that great, but the other two I kind of like. So I'm going to start with those. And <laughs> um, so what I first off really like to do is um, watch better players than me play, but uh, muted. So usually like if you go onto YouTube, watch your videos, watch your streams or some other crushers where you have like respect for their game and think, uh, for example, with Poker Code, you have Stefan, uh, who's like really good. And then what I will do, I will watch their videos, but mute the sound mm -hmm. and then think about like before they act, what would I do? And then watch what they do and ask myself, why did they do that? So without mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the super fast feedback loop you get from the commenting, I, I would just try to solve this spot for myself. So I think that that has been like really helpful. And then uh, if, if we deviate in our actions, I ask myself, why did I do this? Or why did he do it and I didn't do it? So this type of question I will ask myself a lot. And I feel like this helps. Um, it's a bit similar to the second thing I do is where I, in GTO Wizard, I do start up the trainer and mm -hmm. then just drill like specific spots. So I don't mm -hmm. know, three bad pots out of position or I don't know, button versus big blind turns, etc. And mm -hmm. the third mm -hmm. thing I do, which I probably also do daily, which apparently is not a great thing. After my session, I pick up like the biggest pots I won and the biggest pots I lost and go through <laughs> them and sure. check the solver yeah sure and i i like i like the the first ones that you mentioned around like basically you're saying like i like to watch good players and i like to see how they're playing spots i like to um yeah decide myself what action i would take and then i'm thinking about okay they're taking that action why are they taking that action mm -hmm. um might be a good point to, uh to to turn on the volume maybe they explain it to you then um <laughs> or maybe not i don't know but i like this a lot i think watching good players or bet players uh, will help a lot 
um, watching good streams, watching good content on YouTube. There's lots of good content out there now. Lots of people doing like play and explains. I'm watching them pretty often. Um, or if you have, um, you know, one of those like study platforms like Upswing, Poke Code, Razor Edge, whatever it might be, also all really valuable things to look up. Like never been a better time to really learn stuff when um, there's so much great content out there. It's trying trying to navigate through the different ones to find the ones that you like the best and ones that resonate with you the most that like like for me it's all about like the ones that are really really simple the ones that people can break things down in a very very simple way that i can understand it because like you say going on gto wizard pulling up the 10 biggest hands it's like okay i'm looking at you know how i played the hand how solve plays the hand but really not really understanding why you know like mm -hmm. this is the most important part which is you want to understand the game. You want to understand what is going on and the dynamics and the structures behind that. Not mm -hmm. just like, okay, I played this pot. Ah, I played this pot perfectly. It's like, no, we didn't play this pot, spot perfectly. It's like, do you understand like why you might have played it this way or where you might have gone wrong? Solver might agree with you completely that, yeah, this is the kind of line you want to go so you know what you're doing is right, but you may not be reacting well to what villain is doing wrong, which is the questions we talked about at the start, which is also the part then where we need to um, probably get more out of like, what are the biggest hands I'm winning and losing, but more into like the most uncomfortable spots that you were in in that game. Mm -hmm. So boards that you that you saw in standard race parts, three bet parts, where you had no clue what you were doing, even if that spot was, I see bet he folded, Okay, now that spot doesn't make it into your review, right? Because it's not a big pot, but a spot that you actually intuitively was very uncomfortable in. Mm -hmm. And just making a quick note note on the side to say three bet pot, small blind versus uh, cut off, flop was king, king, nine. I had no clue, you know, or whatever the, the flop was. Or mm -hmm. seven, six, five, uh, two tone, like what am I doing there? And you weren't quite sure in game, but you make an action that you think might be okay. But then... Yeah, you bet villain folds and then it's like, okay, I never see that spot again until later on it comes up mm -hmm. and then I'm in the same spot again. I have no idea. And then the spot goes differently and it might take you a long time then to maybe lose a big stack in that scenario because maybe you don't look this one up. And then that's at the point where you solve it. But it's better in game to really just sit with the focus of what do I really want to work on now? What is my plan today? Like, what do I really want to focus my game on? I've been looking at those three bet pots out of position and I want to make that my goal of that session and then review that afterwards. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, for example, that I'm doing a lot before I fire up any session is I will review every single showdown that I played in the last session. And this is important because this is like the raw data that you're getting from your opponents. This is how people actually play against Paul. They like in different spots, right? And that's that's much more valuable than anything else because that will give you a bit of everything. So then you can go through again those again those three steps, even from that study point of view, where you can say, okay, this is how they played against me. Now I want to look up what is right, and then I can understand what they're doing wrong. It's like, like an example of, I don't know, something like you open, cut off, get three bet by small blind, flop comes king, queen, deuce, rainbow, and villain checks this board. And then you get to showdown and you see, wow, surprise, surprise, he has pocket jacks. Like, mm -hmm. it's it, it's like really understanding what he's doing wrong and then going through that exploit. Like, what would be the right exploit versus someone like that, for example? Maybe mm -hmm. we get to barrel a bit more on the turn or whatever it might be. But I always like to take that raw data to then study that part and then really study what that specific villain is doing and then make good notes, mm -hmm. for example. That's also like super great study method. Um, is looking up all those showdowns, but always with a goal. And I think we talked a little bit about this one like offline before we did this, which is <clears throat> I want to always be able to make really good notes on people. And that could be very simple where um, you set yourself a goal for your studying, for example. It's never just, I think you talked about it, in the in Wizard, you set up the drill. It's like I'm drilling three bare parts, for example which is like half of it, but the other half is like, what do you specifically want to look at? Like ask, like you got, solver is great, but it's only great when you can really ask it a very specific question. And mm -hmm. that's the way that you'll get the most out of it. If you just ask it, like how does three bad parts our position work? You get a lot of stuff that you don't really <laughs> fully understand, right? Because there's so much to go through. 
Um, but you need to split that up into different parts. It's like three bad pets, three bad pots are a position on those different board te checks textures. Which ones I can bet my see bet my full range, and then what does my turn strategy look like on different turn cards? Like more specific question that you want to ask is mm -hmm. much better in that in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's like some snippets I would say that might help a little. Just look up before you start start up your next session. Maybe just try and look at every single showdown. Nothing else. Nothing else matters right now, unless you want to really like uh, look up a fun spot that you played. But maybe try and look at that, and then really think about how people are playing against you in the real in the real world. Yeah, that's really valuable. Yeah, I never do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's uh, but it's it's also like I I think I I told you this one as well. It's also my stream is never a good advocate for this because I always show people like the top three hands we won or lost, but more mm -hmm. from a streaming point of view. So mm -hmm. like, um, just as like, because I can't go through all those spots or if mm -hmm. I'm playing NL 100, 200, I don't, I don't really want to do that where people are probably watching my stream and they see how I play against them. But when it's just like um, off stream, then I will go through the mine on it and I will really look at, okay, he uses that size on the turn. Oh, uh, that's the mistake that he makes on the turn using wrong blockers and things like that and really gets himself into trouble. And um, that that's when I have the chance to really sit down and go through exactly what people are doing. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend, highly recommend it. But uh, also, boy, I want to say like it's, the stuff you do also good, like drilling spot. I'm not saying that drilling the spots aren't good. I would like evolve it more to give it more specific. Where is the problem? Like, where do you specifically feel uncomfortable in three bear pots? Like, is it those low boards? Is it your turn strategy or your river sizing? Like, whatever it might be, try to identify the specific problem. You might feel super comfortable on Ace King for Rainbow Button versus Big Blind. Well, no need to look up this spot, right? Like, you understand this one. Um, but more looking at where you find the most, where you find you're the most uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I think like my, my main issue is usually because I try to simplify it as much as it it's possible. I tend to only use one specific line in most spots. So I don't know, sure. I don't know let's, for example, we have. 10 high board in a three bad pot. And I usually on a turn that is uh, a Broadway card, I usually just mm -hmm. always barrel there. Because sure. I think like I, I, I have range advantage. I, it's a good card for me to bet. Uh, so I usually just go big. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So it's like, yeah, knowing how to navigate your range on the turn. And again, it depends on the position, right? If you tell me this is small blind versus button, that Broadway card could be very bad for you. Oh, well, good for you in some ways, but really bad for you in others. So you take mm -hmm. the 10 high board, turn comes a king. Well, villain, again, what I know they're not doing a lot, let's say, is four betting their king 10 suited, which they should do sometimes. Mm -hmm. They're just calling these combos. That turn king is actually feels pretty disgusting then because it's like he's, he sits there with all of that king jack, king 10 mm -hmm. um, stuff, and you just sit there with your ace king, like getting killed by two pair a lot. But I understand what you're saying. You're like looking for that advantage, and then mm -hmm. you're sizing like uh, on the turn, then will dictate, okay, there's a king on the turn. I'm just going to barrel. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to bet this one. And then if they call, you get to the river and it's like, okay, now what? <laughs> yeah. And then that, that's the next thing, you yeah. know? I think like I usually, because I try to be more aggressive than my opponents, I think I tend to over bluff rivers. <laughs> I mean, it like pays off in some respect for sure. Like being aggressive is, it you know, especially in the lower stakes or micro stakes will generally be pretty profitable i would say and you can get away with a lot more mm -hmm. but it's as like you say you go into the nl 100 streets and then yeah then it really matters or it will start to really matter not that there's a big difference between 50 and 100 there's not um this may be another thing that we could uh i could even mention is like you want to go up in the stakes now for example to nl 100 and you'd be interested to hear at what point you think um or like what is the criteria you would feel ready to make that jump um, but generally speaking, probably all the way up to 200, it's like the, the gap is not that large. It's mm -hmm. like you have some good players like in, in those stakes, but generally like the people that are playing NL 100 playing there for a long time, probably. And it's not like they're doing crazy stuff different to you. Lots of them will just not even be studying very much and they're just grinding and um the, the jump in knowledge is not very significant. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, in the same way, like if I, if I told you, Paul, there's a, table on gg running now nl1k 
and there's five fish on the table playing 40 big blinds that are all terrible hell yeah you want to jump on that table right because it yeah. doesn't matter nl1k or not yeah. like this is yeah. a great place to be and that's um kind of like what you want to see is when you jump to nl100 it's like how many like weak players and recreationals are playing there is obviously very important mm -hmm. yes there are some good regs and things that we need to also battle against at, at times mm -hmm. uh, but generally the level is not going to be like astronomically higher than mm -hmm. what you're used to it's not like they're going to be doing crazy stuff and attacking you for no reason kind of thing mm -hmm. this is like what people think in their minds when they're going up and up in stakes it's like yeah it does get a little tougher but generally people are not working that hard so mm -hmm. you can be a bit you can probably re be rest assured that once you get there you'll think huh pretty much the same as what i was doing you yeah, know yeah i think that totally makes sense and i also like i i do coach a couple of micro stakes players and mm -hmm. because i just know the pools really well from a micro stakes point of view and i think i have like a really good sample of crushing all the micros so mm -hmm. i feel like i know what i'm saying when i talk to them and what most of them like this is i think the biggest misconception is that you somehow need to change your game when you move up one limit and sure. then they start to get like fancy uh three bet way too wide or start four betting four bet bluffing a lot with hands they shouldn't be doing that with and stuff like that and then they just kill their win rate so they were let's say they were crushing nl5 and then they move up to NL10 and then they just start spewing because they assume people are going for these crazy bluffs and they always have like are trying to outplay them where they just have aces, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. And I think I think that's a um, really important point, actually, because, yeah, for all people that are playing those micro stakes, I think it's in important what you said. It's like they're not they're not finding this crazy stuff. It's almost it's just the same game. It's just a higher limit that you're playing. That's it. And um, thinking that people are going to start doing crazy stuff that solvers doing versus them pre-flop i said earlier about like those four bet bluffs with king 10 or king jack for example mm -hmm. like people are just never doing but i can tell you for sure not even happening at nl 100 zoom for example very often so <laughs> like and, and this is the thing and as soon as you know this it's like okay now i understand this spot a little bit more i don't need to four bet bluff so much against people that are not three bet bluffing for example mm -hmm. um and I think that's also a very important point for the micros is just like, I call it like um, just waiting for gifts. That's how I see it. And there's different strategies, don't get me wrong. Lots of people are going for crazy red line and stuff like that. And that's all fine. Like multiple strategies can work. It's not like this is the one way to do it. But for me, it's just like, yeah, um, once they're once they're betting big, it's like usually super value heavy, then I'm overfolding. Once they're checking or using small sizing, they usually it's so simple because mm -hmm. it's the most intuitive way that people play poker. Mm -hmm. It's like their natural tendency, like they see a board, but they want to bet because they have queens on an A side board. They don't want to check. It's like, okay, I bet really small here now, or they just check back all the time. And then I just attack this weakness. Like this is, and then this is where the aggression comes from. Um, or if they're betting big, like I say, I'm just like overfolding a lot. Uh, and I'm overfolding a lot on the river, and I know that. So, um, not just in micros, by the way, but it would mm -hmm. it would be for other stakes as well, mm -hmm. for sure. But the important thing for people to know, like what people are doing wrong at the micros, is pretty straightforward. Yeah. I would say. Do you do you get the feeling that since you're also streaming your sessions, people try to play super weird lines against you just because you're <laughs> on stream? Yeah. Uh, I would say so definitely like because uh it's quite funny some of my guys that are watching my stream they call the people out that they see on the nl 100 table and say oh look this guy is here he's on the tables we know he's watching the stream and he just sits there silently watching me play um and it's funny like i'll throw out a comment now and again about this person being a nit or whatever and they're like no i'm not a nit and they'll start going crazy and <laughs> it's it's so funny because like then i'm looking at like they're like in the background like off stream i look at the database i know where the leak is i know what they're doing wrong i see like they're not three betting enough or not four bet bluffing enough i see it plain as day and then they're watching the stream and then i call them out for this and it's like you just see it like plain as day they just start going bananas so mm -hmm. i think it's definitely a thing but i think people also afraid of make of really um looking like a fool on stream as well especially at the higher stakes i would say uh say high, the mid stakes right nl 100 mm -hmm. nl 200 mm -hmm. someone that's quite well known in the pool for example they don't want to be seen to be going crazy so mm -hmm. they just like try to stack you and be like hey look i stacked this queen 
crane streamer guy i make a clip of it and i'll share it with my friends okay i couldn't care less you know mm -hmm. like do mm -hmm. what you want to do um but they, i definitely say like people will automatically think that i'm capable of bluffs in a lot of spots which they're right of course but um uh they will call me down probably i more my feeling is they will call me down pretty light compared to other people because i know once i get called i'm like this is not a good call in in the pool like it's a theoretical good call but the pool is just like not bluffing the spot ever and you catch maybe the like third guy that's bluffing this spot and that's me and mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like i guess they're just doing it for the stream but i don't know maybe i'm wrong <laughs> what's uh, your feeling on this one i yeah i i definitely feel like it's happening a lot and i've talked to other streamers about this as well so i really think like people sometimes they even uh, write in the chat so on the table chat uh right like i'll do it for the stream and then they do some super random exactly stuff. yeah yeah i've had i've had a little bit of that um definitely um yeah. i think i got caught i i did like a micros play and explain um session a couple of weeks ago i did like a giveaway so like i had lots of people jump on the stream and there were some people that were playing the nl5 and mm -hmm. um they just jump on because i'm playing right and um yeah some guy like called me in like a uh, some ridiculous four four bear pot with pocket sixes and then just like calls me on the river it's like i'll do it for the stream kind of thing mm -hmm, yeah, and it's like mm -hmm. okay like that's fine um but i assume that that was just because it was like yeah it's quite a special stream but i understand it as well i think um i think you're right i think there's definitely an element of that for sure um maybe i can ask you a little bit because we talked about um again when i went through those three questions and you talked a little bit about how you study the first part um i do have maybe two smaller questions then i would ask first uh, the first one would be like how do you study that second question what villain is doing wrong so i think as you mentioned like going through the showdowns and seeing what people are doing wrong i'm not doing that at all right now mm -hmm. i usually just tend to go off like my experience for the pool tendencies and sure. I know, all right, people on NL25, uh, I don't know, they, they are not three betting enough. They defend uh, where they should be three betting. Or yeah. people yeah. in this pool like to cold call three bets with a really narrow and specific range. And I feel like it's always right. So mm -hmm. I just go mm -hmm. based off player pool tendencies and not so much of specific opponents because my sure. pools okay. are like, they're too big. And apart from the regs, I don't run into the same player as often. Okay, so because you're playing on Russian cash, right? Yeah. Do you do you ever play reg tables or no? No. Mm, okay. Not okay. on stream, at least. I do like, yeah, sometimes sure. off, but not on stream. Not not on stream. No, that's fine. Maybe my next question is better then around. Um, so, what would you say based on what you know about the pool? So maybe even. You can give me some specific examples might even be good but like what are your favorite exploits so, or what exploits are you using generally yeah so i think my favorite exploit is are two things i i know when people are um not balanced in their check range on the flop i tend to um attack that like every single time 100 percent of the time with large bets <laughs> so i know when mm -hmm. people check back like jack high 10 high nine high boards they're not doing that with a balance range they just don't have anything so when the board doesn't favor their like hand range in total on the turn so if it's not a broadway card i, I mm -hmm. will just relentlessly go at it with anything um, that's like in single race pots where I'm out of position, right? And sure. then so what I also... you're attacking weakness basically, right? You're yeah. you're looking for that weakness because you think people are, uh, as you call it, like not balanced or not yeah playing optimally in those spots. So you attack that weakness, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. And the other spot which I really like is which you probably don't see in mystics at all, but this out of position cold calling of three bets happens a lot. <laughs> in mm -hmm. uh i think nl50 and lower too nl50 not so much anymore but nl25 and lower definitely where you always know when they cold call three bets it's because their hand is like usually a fold in theory but they can't let it go and it's like always the same it's always pocket nines it's always pocket tens or something like <laughs> ace jack ace queen suited that's it it's mm -hmm. like four hands and it's in 90 percent of the 90 percent of the time that's exactly what they're holding 
So you can get away from like really big hands where you know like they have either flopped the set where you can like not get stacked with your kings and aces in that spot where you usually mm -hmm. would or you can just attack it relentlessly if the board doesn't hit those four hands sure yeah okay Ma i mean makes makes sense so you basically like in that scenario where they're just calling out you have a good idea of what their range should will look like because they shouldn't really be calling the small blind let's mm -hmm. say unless it's for an exploitative reason for example they call the small blind because the big blinds are recreational but I guess they're not doing it like that. They're just calling no. because they don't want to three bet, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so then you're giving them a range and then you're basically attacking it depending on the board. So if the board comes like, I don't know, like some 10, 9, deuce, like I guess this is quite a scary board for you then and you're able to get away from certain mm -hmm. cards or s certain hands um, if he starts going crazy. Exactly, yeah. Okay, makes sense, makes sense. Okay, and maybe I give you one scenario to think about. Oh, I'll give you an example of what I see because this is a real example of what people are not doing and you'll see this the same on the micro sticks as well. I will give you one read on a villain and maybe you can just give me some ideas of how you would exploit them. So mm -hmm. that read is just a very easy one, um, which is they're not check raising enough. Uh, if people are not check raising enough, I tend to bet more and then mm -hmm. bet full more with my value hands because I know mm -hmm. their check raising range will never include any bluffs, but just pure value. So nice. boards, I would usually uh, check back, let's say something like nine, seven, five, if I'm the preflop raiser, I usually check this board back because I know my range wants to check there a lot. But if I mm -hmm. know people are not defending, like Rex, you're checking back this board because you know Rex, no, it doesn't hit you. So they will attack the board with check raises more. But if I know someone is not doing that, I will just bet those boards anyways, although I should be sure. checking a lot. Okay, so your answer is like you see bet more. Yeah. That's that's basically it, right? So if someone's not check raising enough, we're see betting we're see betting more. Yeah. Which is which is fine. Like this one is definitely correct. Like we would see bet more, um, definitely. But I was thinking more like specifically about like, like, do you, would you really like look at your hand or like what kind of hands would you start see betting? Which hands would you start checking back also? Um, or is it just, I would bet everything. Is that? I would, I would probably bet everything. <laughs> Love it, Paul. you like, this aggression is great. No, and I think this is important as well. Like, because, um, for sure, like this aggression definitely pays. But I again, when I think about this kind of spot, this is one of the ones then that I um, really start to like dig a bit more deeper into like what hands I'm betting and why. Um, so for example, like you say, if they're not check raising enough and you have, let's say, um, I don't know, let's give it an example. I think you the one you gave earlier under the gun um, versus big blind on queen six five rainbow. Um, you have pocket sixes, let's say. What? What you said you're going to be c betting. What kind of size you're using with pocket sixes on this kind of board, for example? So on the queen high board, I would usually go for a third mm -hmm. as a c bet, sure. and I would think I would bet like I would bet a queen high board like always. I would never maybe let's back there. <laughs> maybe just start with the yeah. We should start with like what the um what, like how like how often are we betting on queen six five rainbow under the gun versus big blind? Would you say like in theory? 90%? 90? Okay, it's just more like 60. But <laughs> it's like, so not so much a range bet, but yeah. kind of close-ish. But yeah, about 60% where we're, we're, we're C-betting that board. And then if you think about then how often Villain wants to check-raise that kind of board texture, like what, what, what kind of percentage would you give? 30%? More like um, 19, but again, I like the aggression. <laughs> I can see this aggression card is great. And this yeah. will help you a lot, actually. Don't like This is a good thing yeah. because the more aggressive you are, it makes it easier to go the other way, opposed to probably my natural tendency to be more on the nittier side. Mm -hmm. um, yours is probably better place to be because you can just hone that in a little, but still keep that aggression. I think it's mm -hmm. it's really good that you're, mm -hmm. you're like that. But yeah, for sure, 30% sounds, sounds pretty high. It's, it's about 9 maybe like 15 to 19 depends what ranges yeah. you use because of the different rig structures and stuff yeah. but let's give them that um so if you go 30 then you're using all kinds of crazy combos which i love um but that yeah, aside I, like that just like tells in this, you in, in this example for example i will mainly check raise like my back doors you know if, mm -hmm. if i have 
uh, some kind of backdoor flush, backdoor straight type of hand. And I know like people see bet the sport with too much as I do, because I know I see bet too much on the sport. <laughs> I tend to check raise a lot with like backdoor draws. Sure. So you're like, it's like, give me an example of this. Like when you say backdoor draw. So I don't know if I have, if, if the board is like queen, nine, six, mm -hmm. um, I will check raise something like four, three suited. Okay. Okay. On Jack nine, six. Yeah. Four three suited as in because of the back door, like you're saying, like back, back door, door flush or back door, back door flush. straight as well. Okay, yeah. okay, I see. So you're taking some of that total trash, but with that kind of like back door equity in your. Yeah, I don't. I, I want to have like the opportunity to make a hand, so I'm not going to be like pure bluffing sure. air. But yeah, uh, absolutely. The like even the lower back door flushes, back door straight type of hands are good enough for me to check raise a board where I know they will be c betting a lot. Sure, sure. And I can see now like definitely where the aggression coming from, which is yeah. which is great. Um, <laughs> but you're right. It's like, and then the question is like, Paul Punts does this. Like, how often do you think someone in your pool does this? Never. Zero percent, right? Yeah. Like just never doing it. Yeah, yeah um, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So like when you think about like exploiting and we use that example of the under the gun versus big blind on uh, queen six five rainbow, like what then you're seeing people check raise on a board like that would probably just be value heavy, right? It will yeah. just be six, five, queen, six. Yeah. It will be uh, pocket sixes, pocket fives. That's it. There's no bluffs in his range. So um, let's say you have something like pocket queens and you are getting check raised. What yeah. would your reaction be then? Against these type of players, I will just fast play my hand because I know they're never sure. folding. Nice. Yeah. Exactly. Because there's two value heavy, right? So, yeah. yeah, you nailed it. It's like, yeah, there's no reason to slow play anymore because there's no bluffs to keep in because they don't have any of that stuff. Yeah. So it's just much better to um, to fast play. Like there are so many spots that I've played, which people think or my villain definitely think that I'm like really stupid and definitely marked me as a fish afterwards for sure. Where mm -hmm. I've just jammed the nuts on the flop because I know they're just like super value heavy and it just makes my life a bit easier. I just yeah. jam all day long, like a spot like, um, cut off versus big blind. Um, and I'm getting three bet. People aren't three betting enough from the big blind. I know that. So I always know that they have super strong hand is pretty much like, like what probably Queens to aces, maybe some ace King now and again, maybe some random ace five suited, uh, mm -hmm. uh, now and again, but um, generally then when the board comes and I'm flopping something super strong, then there's no incentive to slow play. I just jam and uh, because any bad turn cards or river cards, I may not win a stack, right? And I, mm -hmm. this is why I kind of say it's like I win a stack now, not later. Mm -hmm. So I put all the money in now and they're just like, yeah, I call my pocket kings on mm -hmm. seven, six, five, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like they just, that's the way that they're going. Yeah. So um, which all ties into that exploitative part, which, which we, which we can do, but people will think you're crazy and then just mark you down as a fish for sure. But that's yeah. okay. But you're just in reality exploiting the hell out of people. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I get that a lot. Like when I do shorts and I have, for example, uh, so in the micros, for example, four bets out of under the gun against hijack usually are pure value against like 90% again uh, of the population. And I know GTO in theory wants to call a lot with like, it's really strong hands, aces, kings sometimes, but I never do that. I just always jam because I know they're never like in 80% of the time they're, they're not folding if they four bet under the gun. So I just jam exactly. and then people give me like shit in the comments for playing it wrong <laughs> yeah, sure yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. i can i i can see this one but in reality it should be paul well done you exploited the pool and um yeah. you nailed him you know yeah, yeah. is there a follow-up question i think i did not like i didn't do too bad <laughs> no you did no you did super great i think um again like you're probably being more hard on yourself because you might think uh for example like okay you know uh, talking to someone who plays the mid stakes going to be so much better than you and blah 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 it's just not the case like yeah. you can be definitely on the right track of things it's just like what i'd say is like just being much more focused on the specific detail around stuff to understand the game not just looking up in solver how i play this certain spot it's like looking into the detail behind it and really understanding understanding why 
Um, it's just like basic things. I was I was talking to someone that I saw, I'm not like coaching him or anything. I was just helping him out in some spots, and we were just talking about certain boards, and um, we were looking in the in the solver, and like I get to learn a lot also by helping some other people. Um, but there was a spot I can't remember exactly, but it was like there was a certain certain board, and I was really questioning why we bet this random. It was like mm -hmm. some random uh, A7 or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and then the the answer was just because we fold out like some random ace nine ace eight, just that like one step better, and that mm -hmm. was the simple answer. But like understanding stuff like that helps you a lot. So um, it's better to like go in with that specific question that you have than it is to like just really generalize. Did I play this right? Did I play it wrong? Okay, mm -hmm. I'm fine now. I just lose it. No, like you want to dig into the detail, and it could take you months on a certain spot. Um, because you really want to split things up when you're studying into, um, like certain, like a plan, like it's not just mm -hmm. three bet pots out of position, it's three bet pots out of position boards. I see bet my range that I can barrel the turn and then what rivers mm -hmm. am I ha like, that's more, you know, more specific. It's, okay. it's much better to kind of go that way. Okay. That sounds great. So maybe to wrap this up, if you were my coach, what's the homework you would give me after like talking to me now and maybe getting a feel for my game? Um, definitely the first homework I would give you is what we already talked about, which is try after your next session to look at all the showdowns where you played, mm -hmm. whether it's big or small or hands or spots that you felt the most uncomfortable and make a note of that. And then once you've made a bunch of notes, then you can split it up into like categories. So it could be, like I say, three, some three bet pot stuff that you were unsure about. It could literally be a standard race spot. You opened cutoff, big blind, flop came, seven, six, five, monotone. You had no clue or in game, you were unsure of how you play your range. So make a quick note and then you start to split, thing out, split things out. So try to do that is would be my first, first bit of... Uh, homework because then like i say you can see how people actually are playing against you not just the solver yeah that makes sense i will definitely try to incorporate that and let you know how it goes so yeah uh maybe we're gonna wrap this up so this was the first episode of the poker lab thank you damien for joining uh guys make sure to follow crane place poker on all the channels you can see it down here and the final words go to you thank you very much and yeah great to speak to you and i look forward to the next one